Welcome to BRICS Voices, a new interview series showcasing the diverse perspectives within the BRICS community. We are thrilled to introduce Clive Atia as the new force behind this format. Clive is an Australian entrepreneur and electronic engineer, and his involvement in Promethean action adds depth to our content. We are starting with recorded interviews to deliver high quality content while we refine our format. Soon, we plan to introduce live streaming, allowing for a more interactive experience. Our first episode features an interview with Shamakia Ban, a passionate activist striving for the recognition of Somaliland, a region in the Horn of Africa. This captivating story intrigued us, particularly after the recent agreement with Ethiopia. You can watch our in-depth exploration of this topic in the video link below. It is important to know that our channel doesn't align with any particular political viewpoint. Our focus is on the BRICS nations and we aim to promote constructive dialogue. We welcome diverse perspectives, so if you know someone who could contribute to our discussions, please let us know. We value inclusivity and would be delighted to feature multiple perspectives. We hope you enjoy BRICS Voices. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and feel free to suggest any ideas or improvements. Happy watching! So as an introduction to Somaliland, um, Shamake, can you please briefly explain what Somaliland is, including its history, cultural identity, um, and its quest for international recognition? Fantastic, Clive. Thank you very much. Um, Briefly explaining Somaliland's history is actually very difficult. However, I'll give it a go. So the short answer is that Somaliland is not Somalia. Somaliland has no shared history with Somalia apart from a 31 years. It was briefly illegally occupied uh, by Somalia. Somaliland actually received its independence from Britain on the 26th of June 1960, five days before Somalia Italiana became a UN trusteeship. The two countries don't actually share recent nor ancient history. Somaliland is a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic country with a population of almost 6 million people who live in the successor state of uh, notable kingdoms and sultanates, which date back thousands of years. And interestingly, these entities, such as the land of Punt and the Ordo Sultanate, historically, they actually fully utilized Somaliland's geostrategic location as a trade corridor. Somaliland was an integral part of the ancient trading routes uh, and we've seen this in maps across museums in places like Jordan and all sort of history books. Um, Somaliland was a gateway, an integral gateway into and out of Africa, connecting Africa with Arabia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, in the exchange of goods and establishment of trading outposts. Ancient Somaliland traded with the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, Chinese, Indians and many more. However, when the Republic of Somaliland became independent and on the uh, 26th of June 1960, when it became the 17th independent country in Africa, receiving its independence before all the other East African countries we have today, recognized by many countries including Britain, China, France, Ethiopia and the Soviet Union and many others. It actually sought to enter in a union with what was the UN trusteeship of Somalia Italiana, which I mentioned earlier, on the 1st of June 1960. Um, at this time, Somaliland had international borders, a recognized government, as I just mentioned, a constitution and a parliament. I earlier referred to Somaliland being under an illegal occupation, and this might actually confuse some people and say, what's he talking about? But from this point onwards, when Somaliland received its independence, five days later, when it when it thought about this union, what happened was Somaliland and its parliament actually put together an active union which was agreed with Somalia Italiana. But what happened was Somalia Italiana actually did a bit of an Italian job. This active union was never legally ratified and the sham referendum which was held in 1961 was actually rejected by Somaliland citizens. This illegal occupation is further proven by an interesting case in 1961. There was a revolt by Somaliland's uh, soldiers. However, this result, revolt was not successful. And what happened was uh, these soldiers were put before a British judge in a court in Somaliland. However, the judge found that he could not sentence these soldiers because the act of union was never ratified. It was never legal till this date. 
what we refer to as Somalia or the federal government of Somalia, it's provisional. It has a provisional constitution, a provisional government, a provisional uh, president, um, all because of what happened in the 1960s. Yes, it's crazy. This is actually the history that's hidden from the world. Um, and a simple Google search won't unearth, unfortunately. This illegal occupation reached the tipping point in the 1980s. When the Somali Republic committed a brutal genocide against the Isaf tribe in Somaliland, which actually saw up to 500,000 people brutally killed, what you had was fighter jets taking off from the airports of all the major cities in Somaliland, where they actually carpet bombed all these cities until no buildings were left. And their orders they, the orders they followed were famously recorded in history, and they were told to kill all but the crows. The acts of the fascist dictatorship of the Somali Republic led to the birth of a lawful liberation movement called the SNM, or Somali National Movement. This lawful liberation movement ousted the occupying Somali Republic uh, government and forces, uh, and afterwards what it did was it actually utilised local conflict and dispute uh, resolution mechanisms uh, and reclaimed its independence on 18th of May 1991. Somaliland did not rely on foreign aid or international support in this state building process, but instead what it did was it's, it used its own structures and systems to bring about peace and a system of governance that was most reflective of Somaliland's political and social norms and values. This process also included a statewide referendum in 2001, where, where get this, 99.9% .9 of eligible voters who took part there was a whopping 97.1% who actually voted in favour of Somaliland independence. And I'll leave you with a final interesting fact. Some people ask me and others why we keep what they call the colonial name given to Somaliland by the British, uh, which is too similar for some people to Somalia and actually may cause confusion. Well, actually, that's because this name was associated with Somaliland as a country way before Somalia was actually even coined. It's much, much older. The name dates back hundreds, uh, actually even longer than that, uh, at least, uh, you know, 700 years. Um, and what it was referring to was Ardul Somal or Darul Somal. And this was coined by Arab cartographers when they were mapping the region. And the literal translation here is Somaliland, Ardul Somal, Somaliland. Whereas Somalia was actually an Italian creation uh, being given to it in the late 1800s. So um, that's my short answer, Clive. I hope it answered that question. Uh, I'm, I'm struck. Um, let, let, me, let me ask you further because I mean, I was about to, I wanted to, I wanted to interrupt you and I thought, no, I won't interrupt you. Um, so, because I just, I have to ask at this point, just to confirm and just so our audience goes, oh, is that really, because they can, they can rewind it, but you're saying Somalia is provisional. Somaliland is uh, is actually legitimate. Is that right? Am I getting this right? 100% One, hundred Clive. Actually, if we look at the facts, the, the legalities, Somaliland is actually a de jure state, not a de facto state, which some people label it. The, the, the papers Somalia uses to actually sit in institutions like the United Nations actually belong to Somaliland. Somalia illegally annexed and occupied Somaliland since 1960 effectively wow and the provisional part and the provisional part is also interesting because what we have is somalia actually doesn't have a ratified constitution till this day uh their constitution will never be ratified because they still claim somaliland and uh because of the so-called union which they still sort of kind of fantasize about uh somaliland has taken no part in building this you know uh, uh, new transitional federal government of somalia uh, or this federal government of Somalia, however you want to sort of kind of phrase it. Right. Okay. Well, Anastasia, did you want to say something? No, no, no. I'm listening uh, because uh, it's a lot okay. of information I didn't know before. Yeah. 
Uh, well, let, let's continue because, uh, you know, I have some formal questions for you, Shamaki. Uh, and we have this excellent opportunity to interview someone like you who, who knows what's going on and the history. So uh, I don't want to sound too dry, but I just so the audience knows, I'm asking some very formal questions because I, I do want to present this information to the audience um, properly and actually get those particular focus questions answered. Uh, so let me ask you, so what are the most significant challenges facing Somaliland today, both internally and in its efforts to gain international recognition? Perfect. Thank you, Clive. So if we talk about internally first, economically, Somaliland is developing. However, it's almost developing with two hands tied behind its back because it's not internationally recognised. It finds it difficult to attract foreign direct investment due to uh, companies either associating it with the stigma associated with Somalia of, you know, piracy, war, terror, famine, or it finds uh, it difficult to secure insurance for these companies willing to invest unless there's uh, huge companies like DP World and others who have actually taken, you know, that step to investing millions of dollars in Somaliland already. And uh, the other issue facing or challenge facing Somaliland is that it's actually locked out of the international banking settlement and has to also counter Somalia who objects to all deals it makes. Um, and a good example of this is one I mentioned earlier, DP World who invested, uh, you know, half a billion dollars in Somaliland. And what happened was Somalia actually protested at, you know, every avenue it could, all the way right up to the United Nations Security Council. Um, because Somalia never wants any investment inside Somaliland. Uh, this is evident today with the MOU signed with Ethiopia. However, this is why the noise and saber rattling today about this MOU will not face Somaliland. Somalia has done this historically since Somaliland reclaimed its independence and uh, Somaliland will not stop for Somalia. Another issue facing Somaliland today is Somaliland faces an open declaration of war from Somalia. Somalia not only declared this war in parliament uh, with an intention of jihad, of religious war, but it actually also said that it will use significant proportions of its donor-funded budget to wage a campaign to cause instability and conflict in Somaliland. It's laughable, really. So the international community is basically funding Somalia uh, to arm, you know, warlords and rebel groups, which it organizes, which it puts together, it funds, uh, it sets meetings for in Mokdushu, um, and then it arms, which is crazy. And what they intend to do is reduce Somaliland's legitimacy by actually saying, look, there's instability there as well. But it's laughable, and I think the world is awake to this situation. However, it's actually, you know, becoming more and more concerning. And the situation has actually become even more serious since the lifting of Somalia's long-standing arms embargo. As many analysts believe that the proliferation of weapons will not only result in gains for al-Shabaab due to, you know, Somalia's poor inventory management of weapons, which has been mentioned uh, by the United Nations and others. And one thing to note here is Somalia actually has a very close link between uh, its senior officials and al-Shabaab with many of them actually being so-called former Al-Shabaab members. But the government of Somalia directly plans to supply arms to these rebels, these organizations. Then we have, on the other hand, Al-Shabaab, which will get stronger, which will most likely receive weapons both intentionally and unintentionally by, unintentionally by, uh, you know, the Somalia, from the Somalia government. So it's creating literally a hotbed of mess, which is pushed by institutions like the United Nations and America and Britain uh, and others. Um, which will really lead to further conflict. Um, and unfortunately, this is the reality on the ground at the moment. Somaliland has to spend significantly on the stability and security of its country through the tax money it collects from its people. And um, if we come to recognition, the recognition part of your question, let's call it what it is firstly. I always refer to it as re-recognition. Because, in fact, Somaliland was recognized historically, previously. Somaliland's case is unique. It's a legal case which is underpinned by the fact that Somalia, as I said earlier, illegally occupied, annexed and occupied its territory 
due to the illegal union, which was never ratified. Interestingly, this was actually also reaffirmed by a fact-finding mission sent to Somaliland in 2005 by the African Union. This fact-finding mission stated the uniqueness of Somaliland's case and how it won't open a Pandora's box, as many, you know, claim, because Somaliland abides by the African Union Charter, which states the respect for colonial borders and how colonial borders should not be changed. And why is this? Because Somaliland is built on the same international borders recognized on, on the 26th of June 1960 through a number of international uh, treaties and agreements with neighboring countries. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a sort of non-question really when it comes down to legalities. However, the only thing that Somaliland lacked was a state actor willing to state political capital in pushing for the re-recognition of Somaliland. And I think we've found this in Ethiopia now. Uh, also, many what we had was many Western countries would usually tell us, you know, we believe your case is legal, we believe your case is moral, it's right, it's the just thing to do. But what we want to happen is a fellow African country, ideally a neighbor to recognize you, and then we can be the second or third country that recognizes you. Because, you know, there's this stigma attached, especially with the likes of the UK, they don't want people saying, oh, the you know, British colonial, colonialists are at it again. Um, so there's a lot of countries waiting, waiting in the background to actually, you know, uh, um, be the second and third country to recognize Somalia. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Clive. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's even more surprising than your first answer, actually. Uh, let me show the MOU. I mean, just so people can see the document is there. Um, and they can pause and, and read that if they like. Uh, I'm, I'm really surprised. I mean, there was quite a few things going through my head as you were saying your answer, Shimaki. I mean, and I, I don't want to get to, I want to use this time and hear it from you. So I, I will restrain myself and we'll, we'll continue. Because at this point, I guess I'm wondering, you know, your personal journey, you know, as an activist from Somaliland, Maybe you could share with us your journey into into activism. What motivated you to become involved in advocating for Somaliland's very legitimate and surprising cause? Uh, no, that's a, a very valid question, Clive. Thank you. Um, so my parents would take me to Somaliland at a young age, um, and that's what really connected with uh, connected me with my roots. I was not actually born in the United Kingdom, but I came here as a refugee a child fleeing genocide. And I will always be eternally grateful to the UK for being such a welcoming host nation and a fantastic place to actually call home. However, some people actually say I suffer from a mild case of what they say, what they call survivor's guilt, where I believe it's up to me and those like me who should actually do everything they can to be a voice for the voiceless in Somalia, both in seeking justice for the genocide that was perpetrated in the 80s against you know almost six million people in Somaliland and also for the fact that Somaliland today is actually held hostage by a Somalia who claims it rejects its people's exi existence its mere existence by whitewashing its past uh, and obstructing it from all forms of economic development aimed at improving their lives the the interesting thing to note here Clive uh, which actually really really annoys me is that if you search on Google or any other platform about Somalia, uh, what you will hear is that there was a civil war in the 1990s which led to state collapse. But actually that's not true, that's far from the truth. What happened was a state-sponsored genocide against the Isaac clan in Somaliland, and then the rise of the lawful liberation movement, which I mentioned earlier, who pushed out Somalia's forces out of the territory and Somaliland's territory, and then the rest of Somalia went into a civil war. That's the real history. That's the bit that's been watched and not being told uh, to the world. So everyone refers to a civil war, which you know diminishes really what happened to my people, which is uh, why I'm here today to tell the real story. And I think the sad thing today is that there are clear signs of the government of Somalia that the government of Somalia today is seeking to actually continue this genocide from where they left off. 
we have senior officials not only regularly talking, uh, justifying the genocide that happened, but actually they're calling for its completion. There's videos on YouTube with officials from the government of Somalia stating that they would like to see, you know, Somaliland carpet bombed again. And I think this is why Somaliland's case is just, why I have, you know, uh, uh, why I'm so motivated. This adds the necessary fuel to my motivation, really. I hope that answered the question. Yes. And I, I'm, we're very happy to have you to tell your story. Um, absolutely. Um, we're, we're obviously, we're aligned with the BRICS situation and that developing. But we add as... And obviously, Ethiopia is uh, a part of BRICS, and I don't. We just couldn't resist, you know, coming into this. And luckily, we we're able to actually have you, Shamaki, and tell us the real story. I think people are going to be shocked, frankly, if they really, if they actually listen to you, they see this interview. I think they're going to be shocked. There's going to be a lot more questions, and 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 hopefully, you know, it empowers your journey. Um, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it's probably important that I should ask you this, uh, you know, about Somaliland's achievements because you've definitely gone through how Somalia has subverted Somaliland. Um, so, d you know, despite the lack of formal international recognition, which is, again, you know, these questions are obviously from a different narrative, right? So forgive me. Um, so despite the lack of formal international recognition, Somaliland has most notable strides in governance, democracy, and stability. Could you highlight some of these achievements for us? Um, yeah, I can, Clive. So Somaliland is actually a beacon of stability, peace, hope, uh, and success in the region. Uh, this region is known for conflict, violence, death, famine. Um, anything negative you can think of is really associated with this region. However, Somaliland is referred to in, you know, uh, uh, the international political circles as Africa's best kept secret. Because like you and others, people don't really know the truth about Somaliland. When you dig into it, then you actually become an ally automatically. Uh, so Somaliland, with all the challenges it faces, has developed a homegrown system, which I spoke about earlier of governance, which has resulted in multiple free and fair democratic elections. Uh, I was actually a, you know, a party affili affiliated uh, election observer in 2017, uh, where I went from corner to corner in Somaliland, uh, firstly, uh, you know, um, uh, pushing the message of the party that I supported at that time, which did not win the election um, for, for you know, all purposes of you know, cl clarity and uh, interest. Um, and Somaliland's actually done something which many countries in Africa haven't done to this date. We've had multiple peaceful handovers of power. There were occasions where, you know, a president, a sitting president passed away, um, a power was handed over. There was occasions where um, the president lost the election, power was peacefully handed over. There was occasions where the sitting president as he stated, only did one term and then handed over uh, uh, the power. So the interesting thing to note here is Somaliland system is actually in stark contrast to you know, the Somalia people associate it with. Somalia's government has no legitimacy or sovereignty over its land. It's interesting to know that Somalia still, after many years of international donor support and funding, this is billions of dollars I'm talking about, is unable to make significant gains from Al-Shabaab. This is because they lack what Somaliland has. They lack the sincerity, the credibility, and the authority to rule. They are a product of Western interference. Let's not forget many of the so-called government of Somalia are actually the same warlords who caused havoc in Somalia, which we all saw on TV uh, and all the news channels. They actually institutionalized these warlords and rebranded them as a government where they hold uh, sham selections, which is determined by who gets the most funding from uh, international backers in Qatar and uh, Turkey and other uh, you know, countries, or the, use, the misuse, shall I say, of you know, uh, foreign aid meant to support the livelihoods of you know, very, very, very unfortunately poor uh, you know, people in Somalia who 
struggle to make make ends meet. And again, Somalia and these warlords are actually looking to be spoilers of peace in Somaliland. They're hoping to ship the same instability into Somalia after all the progress that it's made. And many countries, including the Western institutions, are just sitting by and watching. Somalia still has a provisional government, a provisional constitution, a provisional president, whereas Somaliland is the beacon of hope that I mentioned. So it's almost like a non-brainer in terms of why the world actually recognizes Somalia. Economically, Somaliland is developing, and due to actually being cut off from you know, the main uh, uh, international world, it's been forced to be creative and self-sufficient. It actually excels in many sectors, including telecommunications, where it is a pioneer of mobile money transfer. It has actually this year joined only a handful of African countries in rolling out its 5G network. Somalia also boasts the second most efficient port in sub-Saharan Africa in its joint venture with DP World, um, who've actually recently also opened the free trade zone, which has already welcomed companies from all across the world. So the future is definitely bright for Somaliland. So thank you very much, Clive. It certainly is. That's, yeah. Well, what about, you know, what is your vision for the future of Somaliland then? You know, how do you see, you know, what you've gone over, you know, how do you see its role in the region and global community um, evolving? So I was going to say I see Somaliland, but actually, you know, Somaliland's governments or Somalilanders see sure. Somaliland essentially as being, you know, the Singapore or the UAE of Africa, providing a stable and strategic base for businesses to set up uh, and prosper. Somaliland is well and truly already open for business and re-recognition will only speed this up and it will only speed up this trajectory aimed at reclaiming its historical position as the gateway into and out of Africa. Somaliland's not asking for handouts or foreign aid. That's not what we're after. What we want is to reclaim our position in the world as an important trading partner which connects, connects Africa and the world. Let's remember, Somaliland's vision is it's underpinned by an ancient track record of success in this arena. We've done it before and we'll do it again. It's also important to note, I think, at this point that Somaliland is already an integral part of the region and the global community of nations where we've already, where we already host a number of diplomatic missions. Somaliland, some people don't actually know this, is actually home to numerous refugees who have left their countries, uh, such as Syria and Yemen, due to conflict and war, and have found a new welcoming home. However, with re-recognition, Somaliland will be able to you know, better support the world in ensuring regional stability in Somalia itself and in the wider, of the wider Horn of Africa as well, as well as the stable Gulf of Aden and Red Sea Corridor, which we all know what's going on today and the instability uh, there with the Houthis and pirates from Somalia. Sure. So hopefully that vision is clear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, you have, you have a, a, it's a little bit redundant in this question, but I think I want to give you the opportunity, you know, to speak to the international community. And, and that's, that's what we're here for. You know, we want to hear from you the truth about Somaliland. Um, so if I ask you, what message would you like to convey to the international community regarding Somaliland and its aspirations? Clive, that message is very simple and very clear. Somaliland and its nearly 6 million citizens have for too long been held hostage in the failed hopes of putting Somalia back together again. However, the international community must come to its senses and recognize the reality on the ground, which is a legal, peaceful, democratic country called Somaliland. It's as simple as that, Clive. I like it. Loud and clear. That's what we like. Well, let's let's bring it back a little bit to the theme of this channel, which is BRICS. Now, Ethiopia's BRICS membership. How does Ethiopia's recent declaration of BRICS membership on the same day the MOU was made public influence its strategic partnerships and regional influence, especially considering its need for access to the sea? 
Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and the way I see it is under Prime Minister Abiy's, you know, visionary, some would say, leadership, Ethiopia is actually on the cusp of agreeing a deal, which it signed on the same day as its, you know, Ascension or BRICS membership. And this deal will allow it to fully achieve its economic potential. Ethiopia clearly wanted to make a statement to you know, the other BRICS members and also the world in order to let them know that they mean business. Ethiopia realizes that this deal is like, very important, both for its economy and its status as a regional power. It requires access to the sea to fully utilize the trade corridor for geopolitical leverage. Ethiopia, after 30 years since Eritrea's in, uh, independence, will once again be a significant player in the Red Sea through its partnership with Somaliland, and the world will have to take note, Clive. It's as simple as that. Good, good. Uh, and I guess that brings up, you know, the regional opposition and support. Um, you know, what are the main reasons behind the regional opposition from Egypt, China and Saudi Arabia and support, notably from the UAE and the Sudan Rapid Support Forces for the MOU and how do these positions reflect the broader geopolitical dynamics in the region? Thanks for that other question, Clive. I think just before I start, though, um, what I would like to make clear is um, I know I've seen some notes and reports of you know affiliations with Sudan's rapid support forces. However, actually, um, this has not been verified by Somaliland, its government. Uh, and there's no signs there. I think there are signs of it uh, re receiving support from the UAE, and some people have made that connection themselves. Um, so I'll leave that part there. Um, okay. But the, sure. the, sign, the signing of the MOU by Somaliland in Ethiopia, uh, it's highlighted a shift in interest among you know, traditional allies and has created unnatural bedfellows in other instances. There are a lot of interest at play here. And actually the parts are moving every day at the moment. There's also further shifting of the geopolitical tectonic plates in the region with alliances now becoming clearer. On the one hand, we have Somaliland, we have Ethiopia, many other African countries and the UAE, which we've already mentioned. And on the other hand, what we have is Somalia, Turkey, Egypt and Eritrea. Um, I mean, Turkey recently signed an MOU with Somalia, effectively making it a modern-day Turkish protectorate. It's crazy. Somalia claims this agreement will protect its territorial integrity against you know, the, uh, the threats coming from what it sees in the Somaliland-Ethiopia MOU. However, one thing is for sure. Turkey is just posturing here. It wants to fully take advantage of Somalia's weak position. In this deal, Turkey receives... 30% of all of Somalia's blue economy for the next 10 years. That's huge. Although when you examine both, you know, the text itself uh, and Turkey's wider interests in the region, and notably its investment in Ethiopia, um, its relationships with Somaliland already. Um, interesting to note, Somaliland's passport is actually accepted in Turkey. Turkey is one of the countries where you can fly to from Somaliland with a, uh, you know, a passport from Somaliland. There is no indication from Turkey that it's willing to risk war for Somalia, even though it's in direct competition with the UAE for control of the important Red Sea Gulf of Aden corridor. It's also important to note that Somalia has pinned all its hopes on a weak defence. This weak defence is that it claims that the MOU will lead to the strengthening of support for Al-Shabaab due to this deal you know, infringing on the same ethno-national expansionist ideologies they hold. This greater Somalia, this notion of greater Somalia, which is essentially, if you look at the flag of Somalia, there's five points to the star, uh, to the star on that flag. The reason for those five points is um, Somalia believes that the lands within which Somalis live in, so you have Somalia, you have Somaliland, you have Djibouti, you have Kenya and you have Ethiopia, parts of those countries, should be reunited in what they term, you know, greater Somalia. In Somali, it's called uh, Somali way. But we reject this notion. We reject it totally as Somalilanders in Somaliland. Uh, I, today, in the 21st century, there's, you know, we don't need more war. We don't need more violence. We don't need more death. What we need is economic development. 
We need to alleviate poverty uh, uh, in the region. We need to uh, start investing in our country, in our human capital, in our youth. And that's what Somaliland stands for. We do not, you know, associate with this ethno-nationalist, expansionist, you know, ideology, which is pushing Somalia's foreign policy. And it's also, uh, like, I, I think one thing to note here is we've had very, very senior politicians who have recently posted images of this greater Somalia, uh, um, you know, um, like image where uh, they say we will retake or reclaim these lands that have been lost. To the extent that we've had also American politicians like Ilhan Omar, who uh, in a video recently posted on social media, actually herself mentioned how uh, she and others aspire to reclaim missing lands. Um, if I move on, so other opposition, what we have is Egypt, uh, who opposes the deal because uh, it now sees Ethiopia as a natural enemy with relations strained due to, you know, fallacies it holds uh, and propagates regarding the Renaissance, the Renaissance dam being built in Ethiopia. Additionally, Egypt was actually one of the countries over the recent past who was trying to court Somaliland what they wanted Somaliland to do was allow it to build a base in Somaliland. No. So Egypt is, is actually, Egypt is actually interestingly uh, a country which in the recent past who tried to court Somaliland to allow Somaliland to build a base uh, for like in, in its country. However, Somaliland refused this. It was aware of what Egypt's intentions were. It wanted to create instability in the Horn, and it said no. Instead, Somaliland saw that its, you know, um, interest lies with Ethiopia and peace in the region. And that's why it signed this deal with Ethiopia. Egypt is now in bed with both Eritrea and Somalia. Eritrea sees relationships with, uh, relations with Ethiopia as a zero-sum game. Uh, anything good for Ethiopia is bad for us. So they naturally oppose this deal for some bizarre reason. Uh, we've got China, who I actually can't say opposes the deal, even though they've used similar rhetoric um, about, you know, support for Somalia's territorial integrity. It's actually sitting on the fence. Um, interestingly, for a country Somalia was actually pinning a lot of hope on, it was one of the last countries to uh, respond and release a statement on the MOU. We've got the USA, um, who've, you know, that said that they're concerned about the implications that may come from uh, the MOU. Um, America wants to preserve its interest in Somalia, where it has spent billions of dollars. And although it works closely with Somaliland as well, the Biden administration clearly wants to have its cake and eat it. It wants to maintain the status quo, which in my, Somaliland's, and many commentators' opinion, is untenable. Let's also remember that it's an election year. And the one thing that the Biden administration are really scared of is that they cannot afford another Afghanistan. And by this, I mean the troops, the international troops, the African troops stationed in Somaliland are due to actually pull out this year. And the fear is that Somalia, Somalia will not be able to function as it does at the moment and will be overrun by al-Shabaab. And if we turn towards you know, support for the MOU, we've got the UAE and, you know, through the DP World investment, um, the huge investment, uh, it has interest, its interests lie with Somalia. Uh, the UAE is another country where you can use the passport of Somaliland to travel freely uh, to. Um, and actually, it's a very influential nation uh, in the Red Sea already. Uh, with ports across the region. It's interestingly not only has ports or uh, manages ports in Somaliland, but it also manages two key ports in Somalia, in Kismayo and in Bosaso. What you have here, and recently um, uh, some sort of sad news coming out of Somalia, um, some military personnel who were sent to Somalia by the UAE and actually one from Bahrain to train uh, uh, Somalia's army were actually brutally murdered in a terrorist attack. And sat, like interestingly here, I mentioned the Turkish, you know, uh, UAE rivalry. Yeah. It will be interesting to see what the UAE response will be to the deal that Tur Turkey and Somalia signed recently, giving it thirty percent, as I mentioned, of its blue economy. Where does this leave uh, the UAE's investment in Somalia? Oh. So, thank you, thank you, Clive.
Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> so many revelations. I mean, I don't mean to laugh. I mean, this is a very serious situation. I'm just, I guess I'm laughing at myself, you know, because I'm thinking, uh, I don't mean to reflect on myself in, so much, but I remember in the 80s what was said about Somalia. And it all makes sense. As you're going through this with us, it all makes sense now what we've experienced with the US, with NATO, with sensitive geopolitical areas, which we're seeing with Yemen, right, in in the channel. It really, I mean, you're really starting to clear this up for me. Um, I think, you know, I want to ask you, because, you know, you sort of said about USA. So I'll just ask you this question, if you don't mind. You know, uh, more specifically, you know, how does the United States strategy of leveraging NGOs to promote its interest in Somaliland, particularly in countering the influence of a common enemy, align with Somaliland's geopolitical aspirations and its representative statements in the US? You touched on that a bit, but if there's anything you can add, because with this common enemy, right? And I do want to ask you about Russia too. Yeah, Clive. Um I think with Somaliland's case, there's for Somaliland, there's there, there is no enemy. Somaliland is seeking international re-recognition equally from all countries. Mm. It doesn't want to, and it isn't picking and choosing and saying, "I want recognition from you." I don't want recognition from you. That's not how it works. Somaliland wants to engage the world, and it's attempting to engage the world. And naturally, what you have is, you know, some countries who are more receptive to your message. Um, a lot of the time, if not all the time, this is not altruistic. Uh, it's because their interests, you know, lie with your interests. And that's what we've seen with um, the USA and many other countries, actually, who recognize the uh, strategic geopolitical location of um, uh, the strategic location of Somalia. So Somaliland's ask is nothing more than, you know, acknowledging the historical facts, the legal facts and the facts on the ground today. And as I said, Somaliland will welcome this equally from all states. We won't pick and choose uh, the the, you know, the common enemy uh, aspect of it. This opportunity is presented to uh, the United States, Russia, China, European countries, uh, and the global community of nations uh, in the same vein. However, what's really important to stress here is that we deploy the principle, naturally, of first mover advantage. Mm. Like, if you recognize Somaliland first or you are among those first countries naturally the government of somaliland and the people of somaliland will be more aligned with with you and your country so i think that that's that's where i'll leave that question no great right no no i was going to say something but i'll leave it uh, let's because obviously things are continuing to get worse um with as far as russia and the nato us conflict right it's european the globalists so but i want to ask you this in relation to somaliland um given russia's historical connections to the horn of africa and its recent engagements with somaliland could moscow's potential recognition of somaliland's independence and investment in its infrastructure signal a shift in regional power dynamics challenging us and eu influence in the area certainly clive uh, you're right you're very right and you know firstly mentioning russia's historical connection with somaliland and the region uh, one example here is berbera airport which i mentioned earlier uh, uh, the, the city i mentioned earlier uh, the airport in that city which has actually one of the longest runways in the continent still to date was built by the soviet union in the mid 1970s Mm. However, as you mentioned earlier, it's it's no secret that the United States and the EU have a slight advantage already as they've been fully utilizing their soft power instruments, uh, which ultimately, you know, work to align Somaliland's interests with their own. Therefore, if Russia wants to truly expand its global presence and challenge the existing geopolitical order, all it has to do is ride what I uh, call the incoming wave recognize somaliland 
Um, since the, the since the turn of the uh, the year when the MOU was signed, uh, Somaliland with, between Somaliland and Ethiopia, what you see is a scramble for Somaliland. Yes, Somaliland. All the major powers are interested in Somaliland's coast because, as I mentioned, it's strategic location and everything that's going on at the moment. Um, but I think at this point, it's important to note that there is growing sentiment within Somaliland itself um, to align itself more with BRICS countries, notably Russia. Some, many noteworthy, you know, Somalilanders, politicians and, you know, uh, um, um, journalists and others are now starting to believe that a better, better relationship can be forged with Russia and others as the West, as I said earlier, wants to have its cake and eat it by maintaining this untenable status quo. So I think the door is well and truly open. Yes, well, and you know, to that, um, and we're certainly interested in, in, in what Russia's doing. I mean, Russia's uh, chairing uh, the BRICS Summit 2024. I think that's what it's called. Is that right, Anastasia? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they want to make an impression. And, you know, there's an opportunity for Russia to, to rehumanize um, the Russian people because they've been dehumanized for many decades now. Um, and it's continuing at an accelerated pace now, um, which is what you've been discussing about Somaliland, you know, really. Um, so you shared a tweet recently because we had some issues with this interview a week ago. We've come back. And so this is a tweet. If you could tell us, Shamaki, who this is. Um, yeah, this is um, Ahmed Garucha. Uh, he's uh, an MP in Somaliland's parliament an elected official um, who clearly is sort of, kind of, you know, talking to what I was mentioning earlier, that the diplomatic doors of Russia are open to Somaliland and vice versa. So I think it's uh, interesting times at the moment. Uh, and what we will continue to see over the, you know, coming months is um, those, uh, you know, tectonic plates I was mentioning earlier mm. continue to shift until uh, the alignment becomes clear. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't take long. It's just a few days between, isn't it? Exactly. Well, uh, this has been a great discussion. Can I? Can we get you back, Shamaki? Because what I'd love to do, right, is there was quite a thing as you were talking, and obviously you know this well because you're from Somaliland and you love Somaliland, but I would like to ask you more questions about some of the answers, you know, focus a little bit more on some of the things um, and pick it apart because I think our audience wants to know more too. They want to know about a little bit more of the details and also get your insights about some of those details as well. Um, so can we get you back another time? 100% Clive, I would be more than happy to do that and, um, yeah, look awesome. forward to it. Oh, yeah. thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Well, We'll leave well, it there. May I have some words? Yes. I would like to thank Shermaki for his time. And um, I would like to talk uh, on behalf of myself. Um, I don't know about you, Clive, but I am reading a lot. I'm uh, Maybe I'm speaking a lot. But today it was, it was a pleasure to listen. And um, it was a bundle of information I didn't know, really. And... It was yeah. so interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting to know about Somaliland. I made some, some notes for myself as well to, to study, to dive deeper. For example, for me, it's interesting about economic economics um, and um, everything. This, how, how this small country, we may call it country, Somaliland, uh, how it is organized, being not recognized, being not recognized, but meantime, the they grow, as you say. They are economically independent, I guess. How do they manage that? So th this is, for me, it's very interesting. And I would like to dive deeper into this. And it would be great if you will come back to, as soon as we have some, maybe more questions from our listeners, from our viewers to ask to you. So no. thank you very much. It, it is very confusing. This, this all this situation about Somaliland, yeah. it is. It's it, it's not easy to you to find uh, uh, so that. But I think we will do. We'll do a research, <laughs> and we will understand how the things are going in. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Shamaki. No, thank you.
Thank you.